April 30th. We begin as we normally do in the Old Testament. Today, we'll be reading from the book of Judges, chapter 11, verse 1, through chapter 12, verse 15. Here is an overview of what's happening in these two chapters. No person should be blamed for the circumstances surrounding his or her birth. We'll see about blame taking place here in the life of uh, the main character. Why permit the things you cannot control to burden your life? Learn to accept them, and the Lord will work out His purposes in His own time. You are not an accident. You are here by God's design. Opposition will one day give way to opportunity. Believe that. Have faith in that, because it's true. Now, there's every evidence that Jephthah was a sincere worshiper of the Lord. He negotiated with uh, the elders in the hearing of the Lord, and he knew the Scriptures. He was a man of faith and courage, as we shall see. He depended on God's power for victory, which, of course, also means he was a wise man. Jephthah knew that God's law prohibited human sacrifices, and certainly the Lord would not have given victory on the basis of such an offer, the offer that uh, we'll hear explained as we read in Scripture. Jephthah's daughter was dedicated to serve the Lord at the tabernacle and therefore remained unmarried. As a result, Jephthah had no descendants to carry on his great name. If she had been sacrificed... It's not likely that the maidens would have been allowed to commemorate the event annually, or that would have been imitating the heathen around them. And then on into the 12th chapter, the very beginning of the 12th chapter of Judges. The men of Ephraim could never rejoice in another's victory as long as they were left out. Jephthah was not as patient and tactful as Gideon, the former judge. And the result was a civil war that took 42,000 lives. Now we're going to learn an interesting word in our reading today. That word is shibboleth. It's in the English dictionary and means a test for determining if you belong. A test for determining if you belong. If you uh, do not conform exactly to what a group demands, well, you are rejected, as we'll see Uh, happened to many of the Ephraimites. Now, some Christians make these minor matters a test of spirituality and fellowship and uh, thereby bring division to the body of Christ. Now, we don't even know where Jephthah was buried. No matter, the Lord keeps the records. And this brave man will get his reward. And with that, let's begin our reading today in the Old Testament. April 30th. Judges chapter 11, verse 1, through chapter 12, verse 15. Now Jephthah of Gilead was a great warrior. He was the son of Gilead, but his mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also had several sons, and when these half-brothers grew up, they chased Jephthah off the land. You will not get any of our father's inheritance, they said, for you are the son of a prostitute. So Jephthah fled from his brothers, and lived in the land of Tob. Soon he had a large band of rebels following him. At about this time, the Ammonites began their war against Israel. When the Ammonites attacked, the leaders of Gilead sent for Jephthah in the land of Tob. They said, Come and be our commander. Help us fight the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to them, Aren't you the ones who hated me and drove me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? Because we need you, they replied. If you will lead us in battle against the Ammonites, we will make you ruler over all the people of Gilead. Jephthah said, If I come with you, and if the Lord gives me victory over the Ammonites, will you really make me ruler over all the people? The Lord is our witness, the leaders replied. We promise to do whatever you say. So Jephthah went with the leaders of Gilead, and he became their ruler and commander of the army. At Mizpah, in the presence of the Lord, Jephthah repeated what he had said to the leaders. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of Ammon, demanding to know why Israel was being attacked. 
The king of Ammon answered Jephthah's messengers, When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they stole my land from the Arnon River to the Jabbok River and all the way to the Jordan. Now then give back the land peaceably. Jephthah sent this message back to the Ammonite king. This is what Jephthah says, Israel did not steal any land from Moab or Ammon. When the people of Israel arrived at Kadesh on their journey from Egypt after crossing the Red Sea, they sent messengers to the king of Edom asking for permission to pass through his land, but their request was denied. Then they asked the king of Moab for similar permission, but he wouldn't let them pass through either. So the people of Israel stayed in Kadesh. Finally, they went around Edom and Moab through the wilderness. They traveled along Moab's eastern border and camped on the other side of the Arnon River, but they never once crossed the Arnon River into Moab. Then Israel sent messengers to King Sihon of the Amorites, who ruled from Heshbon, asking for permission to cross through his land to get to their destination. But King Sihon didn't trust Israel to pass through his land. Instead, he mobilized his army at Jahaz and attacked them. But the Lord, the God of Israel, gave his people victory over King Sion, so Israel took control of all the land of the Amorites, who lived in that region, from the Arnon River to the Jabbok River, and from the wilderness to the Jordan. So you see, it was the Lord, the God of Israel, who took away the land from the Amorites and gave it to Israel. Why then should we give it to you? You keep whatever your god Chemosh gives you, and we will keep whatever the Lord our God gives us. Are you any better than Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he try to make a case against Israel for disputed land? Did he go to war? No, of course not. But now, after three hundred years, you make an issue of this. Israel has been living here all this time spread across the land from Heshbon to Aurorer, and in all the towns along the Arnon River. Why have you made no effort to recover it before now? I have not sinned against you. Rather, you have wronged me by attacking me. Let the Lord, who is judge, decide today which of us is right, Israel or Ammon. But the king of Ammon paid no attention to Jephthah's message. At that time the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he went throughout the land of Gilead and Manasseh, including Mizbah in Gilead, and led an army against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. He said, If you give me victory over the Ammonites, I will give to the Lord the first thing coming out of my house to greet me when I return in triumph. I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering." So Jephthah led his army against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave him victory. He thoroughly defeated the Ammonites from Aurora to an area near Mineth, twenty towns, and as far away as abel Keramim. Thus Israel subdued the Ammonites. When Jephthah returned home to Mizpah, his daughter, his only child, ran out to meet him, playing on a tambourine and dancing for joy. When he saw her, he tore his clothes in anguish. My daughter, he cried out, my heart is breaking. What a tragedy that you came out to greet me, for I have made a vow to the Lord and cannot take it back. And she said, Father, you have made a promise to the Lord. You must do to me what you have promised, for the Lord has given you a great victory over your enemies, the Ammonites. But first, let me go up and roam in the hills and weep with my friends for two months, because I will die a virgin. You may go, Jephthah said. And he let her go away for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept, because she would never have children. When she returned home, her father kept his vow, and she died a virgin. So it has become a custom in Israel for young Israelite women to go away for four days each year, to lament the fate of Jephthah's daughter. Then the tribe of Ephraim mobilized its army and crossed over to Zephon. They sent this message to Jephthah. 
Why didn't you call for us to help you fight against Ammon? We are going to burn down your house with you in it. I summoned you at the beginning of the dispute, but you refused to come, Jephthah said. You failed to help us in our struggle against Ammon. So I risked my life and went to battle without you, and the Lord gave me victory over the Ammonites. So why have you come to fight me? The leaders of Ephraim responded, The men of Gilead are nothing more than rejects from Ephraim and Manasseh. So Jephthah called out his army and attacked the men of Ephraim and defeated them. Jephthah captured the shallows of the Jordan, and whenever a fugitive from Ephraim tried to go back across, the men of Gilead would challenge him. Are you a member of the tribe of Ephraim? they would ask. If the man said, No, I'm not, they would tell him to say, Shiboleth. If he was from Ephraim, he would say, Sibboleth, because people from Ephraim cannot pronounce the word correctly. Then they would take him and kill him at the shallows of the Jordan River. So forty-two thousand Ephraimites were killed at that time. Jephthah was Israel's judge for six years. When he died, he was buried in one of the towns of Gilead. After Jephthah, Ibzan became Israel's judge. He lived in Bethlehem and had thirty sons and thirty daughters. He married his daughters to men outside his clan and brought in thirty young women from outside his clan to marry his sons. Ibzan judged Israel for seven years. When he died, he was buried at Bethlehem. After him, Elon from Zebulun became Israel's judge. He judged Israel for ten years. When he died, he was buried at Ijalon in Zebulun. After Elon died, Abdon, son of Hillel, from Pirathon became Israel's judge. He had forty sons and thirty grandsons, who rode on seventy donkeys. He was Israel's judge for eight years. Then he died and was buried at Pirathon in Ephraim, in the hill country of the Amalekites. April 30th as we look into the New Testament today, we'll be reading from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 28. Now, John had two purposes in mind when he wrote the gospel, to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and to invite people to believe in Him and be saved. His evidence for the deity of Jesus Christ is threefold. Number one, the miracles He performed. Number two, the words He spoke. And number three, the testimony of witnesses who knew Him. The Creator came, as is outlined in the first part of our reading for today. Compare this passage with Genesis chapter 1 and note the emphasis on light and life. They're the same. Moses wrote about the old creation, but John wrote about the new creation. Jesus is the creative Word and the living Word who reveals the Father to us. In His many miracles, Jesus showed His power as Creator. He is a faithful Creator, and you can trust your life to Him. He came with grace and truth, not law and judgment. That's good news for you and me. He revealed the Father and gave the Holy Spirit to those who trusted Him. He is the Lamb of God who alone can take away sins. The blood of lambs covered the sins of the Jews, but the blood of Christ takes away the sins of the whole world. And with that, let's begin our reading today in the New Testament. April 30th, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 28. In the beginning the Word already existed. He was with God, and He was God. He was in the beginning with God. He created everything there is. Nothing exists that He didn't make. Life itself was in Him, and this life gives light to everyone. The light shines through the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent John the Baptist to tell everyone about the light, so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was only a witness to the light. The one who is the true light who gives light to everyone, was going to come into the world. But although the world 
was made through him, the world didn't recognize him when he came. Even in his own land and among his own people, he was not accepted. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn. This is not a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan. This rebirth comes from God. So the Word became human and lived here on earth among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the only Son of the Father. John pointed Him out to the people. He shouted to the crowds, This is the one I was talking about when He said, Someone is coming who is far greater than I am, for He existed long before I did. We have all benefited from the rich blessings He brought to us, one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but His only Son, who is Himself God, is near to the Father's heart. He has told us about Him. This was the testimony of John, when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John whether he claimed to be the Messiah. He flatly denied it. I am not the Messiah, he said. Well, then, who are you? they asked. Are you Elijah? No, he replied. Are you the prophet? No. Then who are you? Tell us, so we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah, I am a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare a straight pathway for the Lord's coming. Then those who were sent by the Pharisees asked him, If you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? John told them, I baptize with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you do not know who will soon begin his ministry. I am not even worthy to be his slave. This incident took place at Bethany, a village east of the Jordan River, where John was baptizing. Today we're reading Psalm 101, verses 1 through 8. We'll learn that determination and dedication characterize this psalm. As David says, I will nine times. And he'll use the word shall six times. He wanted a perfect, that is a blameless heart, not a perverse or twisted heart or a proud heart. Now to be perfect before the Lord does not mean to be sinless. It means to be sincere and without pretense. John called that walking in the light. David wanted justice in the land and the city, just as we do today. But civic righteousness must begin in the heart and in the home. Yes, we need honest people enforcing just laws, but we also need godly people living holy lives starting at home. We must be careful what we look at and listen to and with whom we fellowship. In a world full of illusion, we must avoid lies and must walk in God's wisdom. Now, unlike David... We do not have authority to execute judgment on the wicked. But if our hearts and homes are what God wants them to be, our influence will be felt in the city and also in the nation. Psalm 101, verses 1 through 8, a psalm of David. I will sing of your love and justice. I will praise you, Lord, with songs. I will be careful to live a blameless life. When will you come to my aid? I will lead a life of integrity in my own home. I will refuse to look at anything vile and vulgar. I hate all crooked dealings. I will have nothing to do with them. I will reject perverse ideas and stay away from every evil. I will not tolerate people who slander their neighbors. I will not endure conceit and pride. I will keep a protective eye on the godly, so they may dwell with me in safety. Only those who are above reproach will be allowed to serve me. I will not allow deceivers to serve me, 
and liars will not be allowed to enter my presence. My daily task will be to ferret out criminals and free the city of the Lord from their grip. Proverbs chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Laughter can conceal a heavy heart. When the laughter ends, the grief remains. Backsliders get what they deserve. Good people receive their reward.